So welcome to Compass, uh, uh, associated with the Fabians for this session. Um, my name's Tom Clark, I'm from The Guardian, and we've got um, a stellar cast here of Tim Horton from the Fabians, um, Neil Lawson from Compass, Paul Richards from Progress, John Wilson from Kings in London, and Sarah Ibrahim, who's from The Young Fabians. Um, and of course, we're gonna be talking about the state. Uh, Marx called it a committee of the bourgeoisie, Engels promised it would wither away, and Lenin said not for some time. Um, uh, as this was originally framed, we thought it would be a good time to get a civil war going on the left, because that's the one thing the Labour Party's missing at the moment, and we were going to range the statists against the anti-statists, but talking to my measured colleagues in the antechamber, we decided that views aren't quite that polarised, and it's a bit more subtle than that, although we may try and chide them into... Uh, taking polarised positions a bit later. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but um, I thought, um, and um, Paul, you're free to kick against this if you want, but maybe you could get us going uh, from what I might characterise crudely as a state sceptical position. That was in my briefing. If you're happy with that, if you could talk for two or three minutes and everyone else will get their chance and then we'll take some questions and have a bit of discussion. Good. Needless to say, I was hoping to be going third or fourth and therefore picking up everyone else's points, but I'm happy to kick off. Um, my name is Paul Richards. Uh, I'm a member of the Labour Party uh, and the Fabian Society and Progress. Not Compass, actually, uh, but many of the organisations on this panel. Uh, and my starting point is that socialism has had within it a dynamic and a creative tension from really the Victorian period onwards, which uh, found it's sort of uh, most fertile period before the Second World War, but since has been trampled on um, by the statist idea. And before the uh, foundation of the party and during its early years, there was a, an enormous distrust of the state amongst socialists. They saw the state as a malign force. It wasn't seen as something to be captured uh, and then turned to the good of the majority. It was seen as something to be very wary of. And if you study the um, history of uh, the life of someone, let's say, like Keir Hardy, his socialism was about local organization. He got his socialism from, not from Marx necessarily, but from the temperance movement. And he got it from the church and he got it from the trade unions. Now, not from the head offices of any of those organizations or the central bureaucracy of those organizations, but from local community organizing. Um, Caroline Benn, uh, her book about Hardy is fascinating on this, particularly the links between the temperance movement and the labor movement. Um, you know, we think we've invented all this stuff, but banners and uh, demonstrations and uh, local branches and some of the language and all the rest of it has come straight from temperance. And so his socialism was about local organization. It was not about the state. It was about a, a self-help, but for the working people and adapting the Victorian self-help ethos into something which was very practical. And all of his life was dedicated to this, and him founding the Labour Party and helping to create that Labour movement was all about doing it for yourself. It was a DIY socialism. It wasn't about demanding that others do something and passing a resolution telling the council to do it or telling the government to do it, uh, or any of those sort of models that we've sort of fallen into. Uh, and the same can be said of William Morris, it can be said of Tawney up to a point, it can certainly be said of GDH Cole, who as a Fabian was a decentraliser, and we'll get into the debate around how centralists the Fabians have been over the years, but as a a former chair of the Fabians, I can tell you decentralization has run through Fabianism um, just as strongly as the more statist uh, model, uh, and certainly as much as the sort of, uh, uh, sort of admiration for the Soviet Union and so on that the Webbs enjoyed. So socialism has had this, this theme within it. Look at Orwell. You know, Orwell said, uh, certainly saw the state as a threat, not as a potential benefit. Um, and I think when people like Morris Glassman and so on talk about the 1945 government as a um, sort of where it all went wrong, it needs to be nuanced. I mean, what he's saying and where I agree with him is that the 1945 government was faced with a drastic social situation and they had at, in their hands a load of nationalized organizations like the emergency medical service that had been created in the war to deal with uh, potential ca casualties and so on. And instead of then decentralizing those organizations and doing away with them, they took on the wartime institutions and molded them into peacetime means. And the Labour Party and social democracy has really been grappling with that ever since. You'll know the debate around the National Health Service in 1946 was characterized between central 
centralizers and localists. Now, the centralizers won, but Morrison and others fought a rear guard inside cabinet to say, well, what about local government? Shouldn't they be running the health service? Shouldn't there be locally owned health centers and so on? Uh, and you can see this right the way through to the New Labour's period, and I'll you know, allow, allow others to criti critique New Labour. Um, but the Sure Start program, I'll finish on this, was created as an anarcho-syndicalist sort of ethos. It was about local control, local democracy, people from whatever class coming forward and sharing the services and getting engaged, building that social capital and building up those local campaigns. And then after a few years, the dead hand of the state, and I'm afraid uh, a few Labour ministers along the way just kind of nationalised it all, turned it into an arm of central government. And the tragedy is twofold. First, you do away with all that fantastic social capital but secondly you make it the plaything of ministers and when the ministers change and turn into the blue and the yellow they can scrap sure start at the stroke of a pen because it hasn't been embedded into local ownership and local control there's an irony isn't there that the cooperative congress is meeting this weekend somewhere else um, and indeed at the foundation of the labor party in 1900 they were somewhere else then as well they didn't turn up had they been there and had their votes been enmeshed into the Labour's constitution, I think the co-op ideal, the DIY ideal, uh, the do-it-yourself socialist ideal I'm talking about would have been far more uh, salient in our thinking and indeed in our action in the last 100 years, and that would have been a good thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, John, um, if it's all right, I'm going to come to you next, simply because I saw you'd written an article recently that had a first line, which was, everybody loves the state. Um, which you'll no doubt want to qualify and nuance now. I, and I think the, um, I think actually I agree with pretty much everything Paul's just said. Um, in fact, but I think that what um, I'm not going to kind of adopt a, a pro or anti-state um, um, position. But what I'm going to do is suggest that actually we have a debate about something we really don't know. What, we, we're not sure what, what we're talking about. And I think it's time to get real about what the state actually is and talk about um, you know kind of where power within it actually lies. Um, Whenever I'm around Whitehall, I'm amazed by how small it is. It's tiny. Um, it's, um, you know, kind of, um, the, the, White, Whitehall is, you know, kind of, you know, minuscule when, when you think about the sort of, the, the full range of public service institutions that exist across, across Britain. Um, but I guess the problem with Whitehall is it thinks it has um, a degree of power that I'm not sure it actually really does have. Um, and I think that it projects an image of its power, um, you know, kind of that most people believe. Um, who actually make the most important decisions about the way in which our public services are, are run? Um, well, I'm not sure necessarily it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's Whitehall bureaucrats. I'm not sure even a lot of the time it's ministers. It's um, school teachers. It's, um, you know, care um, home managers. Um, it's sure, sure Start Centre managers and so forth. It's, it's people who... Um, who are kind of sort of doing the difficult job of kind of sort of managing public services on the ground. Um, and, um, you know, kind of they're pulled in lots of different directions. And one of the things I think that, um, that um, th the, I, this false idea of the power of Whitehall um, that we have does is it prevents um, those local public sector managers from um, connecting with their communities and being accountable with, um, you know, kind of to the society that... Um, that exists around them, and that I think actually gives them their, their power. So when I say everybody loves the state, what I want to suggest is that um, the state isn't Whitehall. It's actually kind of sort of the, the complicated, um, uh, pluralistic, kind of messy, um, you know, kind of world of, of public services and beyond um, that um, actually fundamentally relies upon the kind of relationships that we as citizens have with, um, with, with public services. And, and you know, I've um, um, done, done, done a kind of bit bits of work with um, the sort of groups of group of thinkers who've who this word blue labor kind of um, you know sort of is used to, to describe and one of the kind of arguments that uh, people like Morris Glassman and others are, are making I think is is not to say that we should have, have less of the state but that we should make create a state which is um, founded upon those kind of relationships is you know fundamentally um, as Tessa Jow was saying in a, in a session earlier on today um, which is about the kind of relationships between public service workers and um, and and citizens now how do we do that um, I think that um, the answer is democracy, and the answer is to kind of um, is to um, democratize um, the kind of the, the, the local state, the local branches of the state, um, by not by kind of sort of conjuring up you know abstract ideas of, of community, but representing um, or, and organizing the real interests that, that are at stake in every case. There needs to be kind of some kind of stake for the public um, and for national governments who fund um, public services, but also. Um, local workers and local public service users need to be um, involved. And that's the kind of you know, ideas around mutualizing the state, which I think a lot of people are, support, are supporting. Um, so, so the point I want to make is that, um, that, that, ev that 
the state only works when it's loved um, and when it's um, local. Um, that every good public service institution now that we celebrate um, is celebrated for, for what it's doing in real communities um, to real people's lives and it's part of the kind of stories that we use to talk about who we are. Um, and I think that, you know, sort of, that means actually that, that um, Whitehall and, and, um, and, uh, and central government need to kind of um, not so much back off but just develop a far more realistic view of what they can actually um, achieve and realise that their task is to coordinate kind of um, sort of complicated network of public sector institutions, not to not to deliver directly. So, so I mean, Labour needs to rem remember, I think, that um, we're the party of the people, not of the state, and certainly not of the bureaucracy. Okay, Neil. Um, uh, I start with the the view that the state um, is a paradoxical entity. Um, uh, it's not benign. Uh, it ended up. I think with a, a Labour government thinking that you know more state was the answer to absolutely every problem, and that in itself was a problem. You know the state, as Paul said, is sure start, but as we heard this morning, the state is also the police that arrested those people in Fortnum and Masons for protesting legitimately and properly about a huge injustice in our society. So the state is a contradictory entity um, uh, that we have to work in, through, with, and sometimes against. So I start. Um, uh, from that position. Um, and I don't want to get too kind of Marxist, but you can see, you know, three broad uh, eras of the state. Um, you first got this kind of bureaucratic, bureaucratic managerial state based around the kind of Fordist mass production. You're always going to get a centralizing top-down state in a centralizing top-down mass production era. Um, that begins to unravel. Um, uh, as capital and the means of production change, um, uh, uh, and the you know and the class forces etc. change, and you get this movement and this shift towards um, what we might call the market state um, that infiltrates you know every element of our lives, and even the platform today. And for some reasons, we've got pens on the table with Serco on. <coughs> um, it gets you know absolutely everywhere. And in a sense, New Labour was a kind of amalgam of, of those two forms of politics. You know, they, you know, uh, Stalin settled for five-year plans. You know, <laughs> Labour had 10-year plans for the NHS. <coughs> Top-down, bureaucratic, target-driven, not trusting the people. Um, but then it loved the market too and let, you know, Serco in everywhere and used the strong central state in order to open up uh, the state itself to market forces. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the, the dictum that free markets always require a strong state is absolutely right. Mm. You have to have a strong state to police the implications and the symptoms of markets that are too free, to lock people up, to punish them, to discipline them, you know, to police them. Um, so those things go, you know, hand in hand. And the, you know, and the state didn't wither under Mrs. Thatcher. It stayed incredibly strong, but it stayed incredibly strong in some areas and not others. But as people are suggesting, you can begin to see the development of a kind of third era of the state, one which is based much more on a kind of network society, a more decentralized society. And I think we can call that the democratic state, one in which people have direct participation, involvement, voice, etc., in the way it functions. And the holy grail, it seems to me, is to begin to show that that kind of democratic state um, is not just better morally, but it's better um, in terms of efficiency, in terms of effectiveness, that making decisions together collectively as producers and users comes up with better answers than either the politics of the old machine state or the politics of the market state. That people deciding through democratic decisions comes up, may take a bit longer, uh, uh, may be a kind of slightly frustrating as you build the, the, the consensus for change, but by involving people in the process and having their buy into it, you get a more effective state. So that seems to me the holy grail. And, the, and I'll finish on, on this, Tom. The, the, the issue, and I think Francesca alluded to this, she didn't allude to it, she said it quite strongly this morning. The problem is the paradox in all of this for us, because we want, as democratic socialists, whatever, what or whatever we are, we believe in and trust people. And so that